Hello and welcome on Watchers TV for this uh, second edition of Prime Time of the Year. And since our last show, well, quite a lot has been uh, going on, and we'll come back on some uh, new watches, including the much awaited replacement of the AP Royal Oak Jumbo, a timepiece uh, we saw in the flesh here, among others but mainly a lot of crispy business news and we'll immediately start with the biggest one with the announcement of the MBO, the management buyout of Ulysse Nardin and Girard Perigot. So the official change should occur in the first half of 2022 and as a reminder, both brands were in the hands of Kering, the French luxury group, owners of some heavy players of the fashion industry such as Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent. But in the watch department, they only had two, or let's say two and a half, uh, brands, Girard Perigo, including Jean Richard, a brand slightly put on the side a few years back, and Ulysse Narda. So Girard Perigo was officially bought by Kering in 2011, but they were discreetly involved since the early noughties as uh, GP had been struggling for a little while and needed some help or let's say some kind of a financial life buoy. So in the summer of 2014, Kering extended their foothold in the watchmaker industry by purchasing Ulysse Nardin for approximately 850 million Swiss francs, a price which was already considered pretty hefty by the brand under the guidance of its main uh, previous owner, Mr. Rolf Schneider, uh, who passed away in 2011, had developed some serious IP being among the pioneers, for instance, of the use of silicon for watch movement. At the time, Ulysse Nardin had around 450 employees, 350 of them being in Switzerland, and was uh, rather successful on some specific markets, the main one being Russia, and this, one, this last one uh, totally collapsed only a few months after this purchase when sanctions were imposed after the Crimea uh, annexation. So yes, a pretty uh, hefty price tag. In 2017, a new CEO was appointed with the arrival of Patrick Pruneau, having worked for Apple and Tag Heuer before, and since then, well, he has definitely tried to pimp up uh, bro both brands, working on new, more contemporary designs, but especially trying to bring some hype with these uh, two brands with new communication campaigns. So on paper, it seemed like a good strategy, but naturally, it takes some uh, time to see the results, and both companies continue to cost quite a lot of money to the caring group. In September 2020, and related to the COVID situation, around 100 employees were laid off, and a total of 300 employees stayed with uh, these brands, which almost uh, merged together, and Mr. Pruneau became CEO of both brands, actually. In 2021, and speaking about annual turnover of both companies, well, it was apparently a bit less than 50 million uh, Swiss francs, and that's a huge drawback compared to what numbers used to be only a few years back. And it is believed that uh, Caring lost something between 1 and 1.5 billion Swiss francs in the process. So yes, good things had to come to an end at one point. And we hope that this MBO is the best solution for both brands and Caring, whose CEO, François-Henri Pinault, was most probably more leaded through his well-known passion for watchmaking than his accounting team during all those watchmaking years for Caring. So we therefore have to say a big thank you to him and to give you a last general idea regarding Caring, where his average annual turnover during the past years around 15 billion euros for a profitability of around 20%. Approximately 60% of its turnover is made by Gucci and 15% uh, with uh, Yves Saint Laurent. So yes, watchmaking is quite a negligible activity on Caring's uh, balance sheet and we hope that the current uh, dedicated management team will be able to bring back these brands to some profitability but it especially means that they must have found some external guarantees uh, slash financing to make it happen and personally I'm quite intrigued how this deal is structured and we will dig a little bit more. Okay, next, uh, business news, and the Swatch Group uh, published its uh, 2021 figures a few days ago with an annual turnover of 7.3 billion Swiss franc, up 30% compared to 2020, and a profitability of almost 1 billion compared to 52 million a year before. Some financial medias mentioned that 75% uh, of its profits were made by three brands, Omega, Longines, and Tissot, and we should highlight the strong return of Tissot, actually, because uh, probably, I mean, the PRX collection helped them in, the, in this price segment, especially that uh, they are really competing against uh, smartwatches. And these numbers also highlight the fact that the Swatch Group uh, knows to handle large volume brands because this unfortunately can't be said about the luxury brands Breguet, Harry Winston, Jacques Hedro and Blancpain, though it seems this last one is uh, not doing that bad. 
So Richemont also published some numbers, uh, although their fiscal year ends at the end of March. But nonetheless, uh, Q3 of 2021 saw a 35% jump of its consolidated turnover. But we know that this is mainly driven by the jewelry activity of Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpels. But nonetheless, the figures were above market expectation and the shares of Richemont have uh, never been as high as now but would be really pertinent to have a much clearer breakdown of these numbers. So if you compare the first nine months of their turnover between 21 and 20, well, that's an increase of roughly 50%, but it is fair to say that the luxury as a whole enjoyed a solid year and how to best uh, illustrate this uh, with nothing less than the world's number one group, LVMH, which did a consolidated turnover 64 billion euros plus 44% over one year and 12 billion profit and jewelry and watches representing almost 9 billion of this turnover. But as with the Richmond Group, I mean, the watchmaking division represents a small portion of these 9 billions. And you have to take into account that now uh, the Tiffany has been incorporated into this uh, uh, global and uh, consolidated turnover. But you have to put this into the perspective of things, because if you compare it to Apple in one quarter, Q4 of last year, well, Apple just did $124 billion of turnover. So yes, our beloved uh, watchmaking industry is indeed quite small in comparison, and that's totally fine by me, but what's important to take uh, from all this is that we're in a positive dynamic with the product shortage uh, that goes with it. And this, in turn, is a good opportunity for other watch brands, either newcomers or brands that were maybe a bit less appealing before. And if they do things right, well, they could well serve the wave too, which again highlights the poor performance of the luxury brands of the Swatch Group, as they should be fully alive and kicking uh, with the, the, the backing they have. But then it comes to products and then desirability, something money can't buy. But, you know, just a question of taste. And coming back on this notion of hype, well, I would say that this one is today absolutely crucial and most of the successful brands are those that manage to do things right when it comes to be perceived as, uh, as being hype and cool. And a really good example is the phenomenal success of Audemars Piguet of the last decade. Okay, they have the luxury to play with an amazing icon as the Royal Oak celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary this year. And I'll get back on this uh, very shortly, but sincerely, I think it goes beyond that. So people can like or like less uh, François-Henri Benamias, its CEO, but since he took the helm of the company, one can seriously and objectively say that he did some good work in terms of hyping the brand. Okay, maybe the code 1159 is still questionable, but overall he totally succeeded in modernizing the image of AP with some pretty cool campaigns. I mean, ones with taste and edgy feel to them, but also the opening of the AP houses around the world. Obviously, for some retailers who had a nice cash cow before, well, they probably think a little bit different as most timepieces are today sold in their own boutiques or partner boutiques. And this is in fact, increasing the link between the customers and the brand. Ultimately, this result is an amazing increase of turnover, and we even heard rumors that AP could equal Patek sales in 2022. So yes, that's quite crazy and quite an achievement. And continuing down the rumor path, uh, well, it seems that AP is potentially looking for a new CEO, but if that's the case, well, the board has to be cautious not to break this positive and hype dynamic. But let's now talk products, and yes, 2022 marks the 50th anniversary of an absolute icon, and only a few days ago was released a series of new uh, Royal Oaks, but we already know more will come during and throughout the year. So this famous watch was originally designed by Gérald Janta, and among uh, these releases, AP had to pay tribute to the very first one, the so-called Jumbo, as it was perceived as being huge 50 years ago, and yes, times change. On this new model, the 16202, one of the main difference concerns the logo with the full name of the brand appearing and is still printed on the dial. So we managed to get our hands on two different models, one uh, naturally uh, being paying this tribute to its uh, ancestor and the other one coming in this yellow gold attire with a bit of a black fumé dial. Personally, I think the black gradient is a little bit too present, but when you play with light, well, you see that uh, something is indeed happening there. And as a little side note, and for the ones who know a little bit of the history of the brand, it is interesting to mention that the AP logo was introduced in 1972 on the dial of this uh, very first Royal Oak, before it simply didn't exist. And the main reason for its creation was that the name Eau de Marpiguet was difficult to pronounce in some languages, Asian languages in particular. So that's why it was uh, simplified to these two letters, A, 
P. And since then, it was almost constantly used on all royal oaks, with the exception of some perpetual calendars, sometimes tourbillon and a few other exceptions. But this anniversary was also an opportunity to replace the good old caliber 2121, a caliber also used on some Vacheron Constantin or Patek Philippe timepieces. This new caliber is called 7121 and beats at a higher frequency than the previous one, 4 Hz compared to 2.75, and the power reserve has also been improved uh, more than 55 hours for this new one uh, compared to 40 hours for the previous one. This caliber finally features a quick date change, something so much more convenient as some collectors must remember moving the hour hand from 9 pm to midnight and so on to move the date. Well, this used to be quite tedious if you had to do almost one month like this, but now this is something of the past. Nevertheless, this new movement has something similar to the previous one. It has a hanging barrel which holds only on the bridge side and not on the main plate side. It is a bit like having a bicycle wheel held only on one side, uh, and this allows a thinner movement. However, the new one is a slightly thicker 3.2mm compared to 305 and other Royal Oak uh, models were also launched uh, for this anniversary, some really nice chronographs, just the right size, but that's according to me. And we had a chance of having another two of these new APs coming to our club space, but hopefully we will uh, come back more in details in the coming weeks regarding this 50th birthday celebration. To summarize things, the main new design elements with these new models concern the logo, now 3D printed as on the code 1159. The bracelet links are just a little bit thinner and this contributes to a more comfortable feel. And when you look at the log part, well, uh, you can see that this little facet has been slightly enlarged and now captures light a bit more, uh, a bit more evidently. So little changes here and there feels almost like the Rolex evolution of their watches with the really tiny details. But again, when you have such a clear winner in your collection, well, you have to be respectful and be cautious on these minute uh, changes. Anyhow, uh, we know we will be in for some more novelties uh, coming from AP, uh, but I can already tell you that there won't be a massive Royal Oak party taking place, but more small events around the world and mainly in these uh, AP houses. So I don't want to carry on too long and I know that the digital LVMH watch week occurred a few days ago. We did see some pretty cool things in particular coming from Zenith uh, with uh, Julien Torna, its CEO, who is doing a good job at precisely making the brand hyper uh, with some funky and quite daring design. Same can be said about Tag Heuer and there too you can definitely feel that under the guidance of its uh, new CEO, the son of uh, Bernard Arnault, well he's bringing some freshness and I hope it will do the job and get the brand back uh, to where it should belong. Well, regarding Hublot, well, same, same, and I don't have much to say. Okay, I'm reaching the end of this prime time and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for the marvelous feedback we got regarding some of our recent videos. And I feel extremely happy and proud regarding the Georges Dubois interview published recently because your comments have really moved us and uh, we will have some more reports going in that direction coming soon. Okay, not necessarily with a hundred year old guy, but with the uh, people that have really experienced the evolution of watchmaking. These testimonies are necessary and they will leave an eternal trace of the life of some great individuals and we are just very blessed being able to film and share uh, with you these kinds of contents. So thanks so much. Uh, we have many great videos coming. Thanks so much again to our patrons and see you real soon. And of course, viva watchmaking to you. All the very best. See you.